Welcome back, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here with another China History Podcast episode. The History of Chinese Medicine, Part 3 this time. I'd like to look at a few odds and ends from in between the Jin Dynasty and the Northern and Southern Dynasties period up to the Sui and the Tang in the 7th century. Then I'd like to circle back, if no one has too much objection, and examine the other most famous of ancient Chinese medical texts, the Shen Nong Ban Cao Jing, or Divine Farmers Materia Medica, among a myriad of other foreign names it goes by. We've looked at a lot of the mythical founding fathers of Chinese medicine and some of the lore surrounding their prominence as early physicians. We've also looked at the Su Wen and the Ling Shu, the two books that made up the Yellow Emperor's inner canon. And let me mention one more time the concept of pulsology. This is another aspect of TCM that was long ago discovered by Chinese physicians. In many of the chapters in the Ling Shu of the Yellow Emperor's Inner Canon, we obtain a detailed look at the Chinese science and art of pulsology. Those trained in the fine points of this branch of TCM were able to diagnose illnesses by feeling the pulse of the patient. And just by using their three fingers placed upon a patient's wrist, the pulses would reveal where the problem or imbalance lie inside the body. Feeling the pulse on the patient's right wrist using your index finger, middle finger, and ring finger, a.k.a. the fourth finger, a pulsologist could hone in on the three organs associated with the pulse felt by these three fingers. The index finger pertained to the lungs, the middle finger to the stomach, and the fourth finger to the spleen. And then on the left wrist, these three fingers would feel the radial pulse, and this would reveal the condition of the heart, liver, and kidneys. But that was the easy part. The act of feeling the patient's pulse was multidimensional. This is what made it such a difficult thing to learn. There were three levels of pressure applied in order to receive a total of nine readings. Light pressure, when taking the patient's radial pulse, gave a reading of the situation in general. But using moderate pressure, a second layer of pulses could be felt that shed more light on the conditions of other vital bodily organs. And then with heavier pressure placed on that radial artery of the wrist by the three fingers, it gave further readings on the organs in the lower body. I explained in part one, these were the tun, guan, and shi points, the inch, gait, and foot points. And if you descend a little deeper into the art of pulsology, there were four definitions to describe the nature or vibe that the pulse gave out. For example, a floating effect of the pulse meant the patient is feverish. A pulse with a sinking feeling meant blood circulation was slow and there's weakness throughout the body. If the pulse was slow yet regular, it meant blood circulation pressure was low, and a rapid but regular pulse meant the blood is circulating too fast. And a pulsologist was trained in feeling and interpreting these floating, sinking, slow, and rapid sensations in all their manifestations. And since it had been an accepted fact that according to Qi Bo, all diseases originated in either the heart, liver, lungs, kidneys, or the stomach, intestine, spleen complex, by being able to measure and analyze the pulse, a trained pulsologist could zero in on the location and cause for the imbalance. A trained and effective pulsologist was able to read the nuances in the pulses, and in consort with examining the patient, the pulsologist could make, to the best of their abilities, given the knowledge of their times, qualitative decisions concerning what was necessary to do in order to bring the patient's body back into harmony, in balance with the doll. And after the diagnosis is made, after the doctor has determined where the imbalance is in the body, where the chi is deficient or too much, they will give their prescription for either 
an herbal remedy, a lifestyle change, or some other therapeutic treatment specifically designed to bring the patient's body and spirit back into harmony. In part one, I mentioned one of the early greats, Chang Zhongqing, or Zhang Ji, as he's also known. He lived in the final years of the Eastern Han, and I mentioned his renowned work, the Shang Han Zaping Lun, the Shang Han Lun, the Treatise of Cold Damage Disorders, the first comprehensive treatise on externally contracted diseases, including over a hundred updated prescriptions from the Shennong Materia Medica. And this book had incredible staying power over the centuries. Wang Shu He, who was born right around the time of Zhang Zhongjing's passing, lived 210 to 280. And this was during the Three Kingdoms and Western Qin. Wang Shu He was respected and talented enough to make it to the position of Tai Yi, or Imperial Physician. And aside from bringing back to life many of the lost texts of Zhang Zhongjing, he gave us the Mai Jing, the Treatise on Pulsology. Wang Shu He, through this book and for advancing a lot of the previous knowledge of pulsology, brought this science to a new level of development. During his lifetime, he was well regarded for his understanding of the pulses and how to treat people based on the diagnoses he made. Besides the long-lasting treatise on pulsology, he was also credited with other works related to pulsology. Historians must have held him in high regard because his humble origins and simple lifestyle were played up quite a bit in the bios written about him. But like it is with later scholars who rewrote the histories and treatises of their predecessors, some believe Wang Shu He distorted a lot of Chang Zhong Jing's original meaning in the Shanghan Lun. So return from acupuncture, the meridians, pulsology, and internal medicine, and all that, to the other most famous of aspects of traditional Chinese medicine, herbal remedies, and the Shen Nong Ben Cao Jing, or Divine Farmers Materia Medica, the classic of the way of herbal medicine. Shen Nong's herbal classic, the Divine Husbandman's Classic of Materia Medica, and a whole lot more in all the other languages of the world. As we'll see later in this episode, and also in Part 4, this Divine Farmer's Materia Medica was just the earliest and most famous of these kinds of compendia of remedial substances employed in medicine. And just like the Yellow Emperor didn't write the Yellow Emperor's inner canon, well... So it was with Shen Nong and this work that's attributed to him. Shen Nong was one of the three sovereigns and part of that holy trinity of god emperors who lived during China's most ancient evenings. Part of the reason for putting Shen Nong's name in the title was because of the myth surrounding his sharing of knowledge about what herbs were most beneficial to the human body, particularly when one was afflicted with a malady or acute toxin of some sort. It was compiled and written down into its final version sometime during the Han Dynasty, probably during the reign of Emperor Guangwu. It contained an amalgamation of all known information concerning the effect of plants or combinations of plants as medicines. And up until the introduction of synthetic drugs, flora and fauna is what humans most depended on to fight disease and provide relief from a multitude of afflictions. The ancient process of testing which herbs were safe and effective for the intended purpose left many dead bodies in its wake, not including all the deaths from consuming poisonous alchemical elixirs, a lot of people were sacrificed on the altar of human experimentation with respect to herbal remedies. The story of Shen Nong testing the 360-odd herbs to weed out the toxic ones is a well-known one from the myths surrounding his time on Earth in the 28th century B.C. Pangolins, rhinoceroses, tigers, black bears, and seahorses are... Some of the animals pointed to as the marquee species whose harvesting of their body parts is well known to all. And this is part of the dark side of TCM. 
Prominent among these plant species are, of course, ginseng, but also mahuang, or Chinese ephedra, ephedra sinica. This has been an old stalwart for various respiratory conditions like asthma, hay fever, bronchitis, and the common flu. It's most commonly found in nasal decongestants and asthma inhalers. It's got some bad side effects and is banned in a lot of places or strictly controlled. I don't know about now, but it was once a precursor drug for the manufacture of methamphetamine. Cinnamon, licorice, and mint were also well-known roots and herbs that were also utilized in conjunction with other herbs or herbal formulas to create these extracts. The Shen Nong Ban Cao Jing concerns itself with not just individual species of plants and herbs, it also created a whole recipe book filled with 365 yao, or prescriptions, of which 252 were medicinal herbs, and there were 67 remedies that used animal parts, 46 made of mineral substances, including mercury, derived from cinnabar. The way Shen Nong explained it in his book, when mixing these compounds, there were four essential characters who played complementary roles in making the drug effective. And these characters went by many names and descriptions, but most important was the emperor. This was the main herb with the most important active ingredients. This was the the emperor herb. And then there was the premier, the herb of secondary importance, but which reminded the emperor of the ways in which it must act on the one who ingested this herbal remedy. Then there was the assistant whose role was to act as a catalyst to the emperor, optimizing its essential ingredients that would cure the patient. And last, there was the guide. Like the other two ingredients, the premier and the assistant, the guide's role was to prepare the way for the main herb, signified as the emperor component, to act to its fullest potential. All the drugs listed in the Materia Medica are described in detail with all the knowledge and authority that someone from these first centuries B.C. and A.D. could offer. Tao Hong Jing figures prominently in the Shandong Materia Medica for his collected annotations concerning the work. You remember Tao Hong Jing from the recent Gui Guzha episode. He was famous for many things, including his tight relationship with Liang Dynasty founder Emperor Wu. Tao Hong Jing loomed very large in the field of Taoism and is considered one of the most important Taoist scholars of the olden days. He lived 456 to 536. He also appeared in that History of Chinese Alchemy Part 2 episode for all his contributions made in that dubious science. Emperor Wu of Liang was particularly interested in Tao Hong Jing's experimentation with an elixir of life. Well, this great polymath of his age also did much to resurrect the Shen Nong Ban Cao Jing, copies of which were lost in the chaos of the 3rd and 4th centuries. But it made a reappearance thanks to Tao Hong Jing's mention and for his annotations to this work attributed honorably to the divine farmer, Shen Nong. His version is called the Shen Nong Ban Cao Jing Ji Zhu, the collected annotations of the Shen Nong Materia Medica. Here, Tao Hong Jing traced the history of the great advances and herbal discoveries going back to the Zhou Dynasty. All of the contents of the lost original are, scholars believe, contained in this Tao Hong Jing Qi Zhu version. The only problem is, yeah, you guessed it, there was quite a bit of chaos and disunity in between the major dynasties, and this text as well was thought to be lost. By the time of the Song Dynasty, 960 to 1279, the country caught a breather. There was relative peace throughout the land and plenty of imperial and aristocratic money to support the collected efforts of all Song scholars of the day. Through some good old forensic scholarship, the Shandong Materia Medica was stitched back together again, as well as the annotations by Tao Hong Jing. Tao Hong Jing, besides his work on putting the Materia Medica back together, also established a classification system for herbal medicines 
based on their main properties. And he also upped the number of proven effective herbal medications to 730 from the 365 mentioned in the original text. So he figures prominently in the pre-Tang Dynasty years where science and medicine was concerned, not to mention Taoism. Always mentioned hand-in-hand with Tao Hongjing was another great mind in his day. That's Ge Hong. He lived during the Eastern Jin and was one of the best known of all the early Chinese alchemists. He was famous for the Bao Puzi, a text of all his most important writings. And besides all the alchemical theory and practice for which he's best remembered, Ge Hong also discussed herbal medicine, plants, and minerals as ingredients that could be consumed to restore balance in whatever part of the body was affected. And so long-lasting was Ge Hong's Baopuzi text, many of the concoctions he first named are still in use in one form or another today. He also wrote another rather significant medical text called the Zhou Ho Bei Ji Fang that lists all the most common major diseases that afflicted people. Among them were many of the shining stars of some of the greatest epidemics that have ravaged humankind since time immemorial. Ge Hong included them in the text. These were diseases such as cholera, typhoid, malaria, leprosy, dysentery, and smallpox. Later on, Tao Hong Jing will take Ge Hong's work, the Zhou Ho Bei Ji Fang, and update it further as the 101 Emergency Prescriptions, or Zhou Ho Bai Yi Fang. In his lifetime, Ge Hong produced monumental works on alchemy, for which he's most famous, and in Taoist philosophy and religion, and lastly with his work in Yi Xue, or the science of medicine. Ge Hong's most famous text, the Bao Puzi, is filled with detailed observation and analysis about the therapeutic effects of hundreds of herbs and concoctions. And he also had a profound impact on advancing the understanding of moxibustion. He brought all the science up to date and, through clear and easy-to-understand language, made moxibustion more accessible as a treatment. This had a great impact on the physicians who followed in his wake, as Ge Hong had done so much of the heavy lifting to carry out the experimentation and analysis. So what the Yellow Emperor's inner canon did for the basic understanding of the human body about qi, yin and yang, the five elements, the meridians, acupuncture, moxibustion, and other basic principles. Shen Nong's Materia Medica did for herbal and plant-based substances as drugs to restore the body's inner balance. It classified all the herbs into their medical properties and named them as either superior, medium, or inferior, depending on the toxicity of the substance, its beneficial properties, and whether or not, on its own merits, contributed to a patient's long-term health and well-being. And lastly, it was an encyclopedia of herbs and served as a reference book for later scientists and physicians. The Shen Nong Materia Medica served as a Eastern Han Dynasty benchmark of what was known about herbal, plant, and mineral-based medicines. So even though the Shen Nong Ban Cao Jing that we read today wasn't the exact same text as the original one from antiquity, it's still a useful guidebook concerning the earliest understanding of Chinese medicinal plants, roots, and concoctions that subsequent Chinese scholars and scientists would build on. I named Ge Hong and Tao Hong Jing as just two examples, but there were also several others from these first five or six centuries of the Common Era, or Anno Domini, if you wish. The experiments and work carried out by Ge Hong were the earliest crude beginnings of preparing chemicals to produce drugs. I should have mentioned them last episode, maybe I did, but one more important figure from the history of Chinese medicine is Wang Bing. He famously spent 12 years poring over the Yellow Emperor's inner canon and produced a work that vigorously revised and rearranged the received text and added additional new commentary. And this popular Wang Bing version of the Yellow Emperor's inner canon 
got another major touch-up during the northern Song dynasty. And this Song version is, for the most part, what we have today and serves as the source text for translators all over the world to work with. But let me back up a little and mention another important person from 1,400 years ago during the 169 years of the Northern and Southern Dynasties period. There was a man named Gong Qingxuan. He lived during the years that straddled the second and third of the Southern Dynasties. This was the Southern Qi and the Liang, 479 to 557. Mayan civilization was flourishing in Mexico, Justinian I in Byzantium, the collapse of the Gupta Empire in India, the last years on earth before the birth of the prophet Muhammad in Mecca. Gong Qingxuan was another in a long line of scholarly figures in Chinese history who achieved fame for his efforts in compiling important and groundbreaking works previously believed to be lost to the ages. He's mentioned in the Book of Jin and hailed for his work on the Liu Jianzi Gui Yi Fang, the earliest extant monograph on surgery techniques in China. This book of surgery has a bit of a legend associated to it. There was a story that claimed Gong Qingxuan came into possession of a secret book that had been hidden away for a long time, containing useful and practical information and covered a wide spectrum of medical advice and listed treatments and recipes for herbal and other kinds of prescriptions. The book was originally written by Liu Jianzi. Gong Qingxuan was related to Liu Jianzi through his sister. Gong was the great-grandson of this relative, and that may have had something to do with the book falling into his hands. And for five years, Gong practiced medicine and referred to this secret book often in the treatment of his patients and in prescribing medicines. And the information contained in this book, called the Gui Yifang, or Ghost Prescriptions, proved to be very effective. And on top of that, this book also gave lots of insight into the current state of the art for surgical procedures in China at the time it was published in 499. It was mainly concerned with anything and everything about sores on your body, carbuncles, boils, scabies, and other kinds of external and internal ulcers of the body. It contained 140 prescriptions for all of these various kinds of maladies that came in ointments, plasters, and in forms that could be ingested. This 17-decade period of the northern and southern dynasties was one of constant warfare. Injuries from battle were commonplace, and this book also addressed surgeries related to wounds received on the fields of battle. The original text written by Liu Jianzi was lost. And the secret book that fell into Gong Qingxuan's hands was outdated and in dire need of revisions and updates. He spent many years bringing this text back to life and made it current to the late 5th century and early 6th century times that he lived in. And to honor the original author, he called it the Liu Jianzi, Gui Yifang, Liu Jianzi's Ghost Prescriptions attributing various cures and medicines to ghosts or spirits was one of the things they used to do way back then. People were a lot more superstitious than in our day, and that gui, or ghost term, gave the title some panache, as it indicated that the secret wisdom contained within the text came from beyond the world of the living. There's one more important person I wanted to mention as we close in on the Tang Dynasty. This was Chao Yuanfang. He's another one. Not much concerning his life story, other than to say he's remembered for his work he may or may not have written and compiled. This was another landmark text in the history of Chinese medicine. Chao Yuanfang, who lived during the end of the Sui and beginning of the Tang, 550 to 630, well, it's believed he served at the court of Emperor Yang of Sui. He was mentioned as serving as the Tai Yi and was referred to as the Tai Yi Bo Shi. The Tai Yi, you might recall from previous episodes, was the imperial court physician. 
A branch of the imperial government was created in the Sui called the Taiyi Shu. A Shu is a government office or bureau. And this office of the imperial physician was the first of its kind in China and possibly in world history. This was an imperial level office that regulated the training of physicians. Things had come a long way since the Zhou Dynasty shamans, and medicine was now being regulated by the central government. And we remember Chao Yuanfang for doing what others had done before him. After a period of time, so much information had become either outdated, in need of a revision, or there were entirely new discoveries made. And it always fell to someone who had the talent to sort through the documents, ancient and recent, and organize them, remove what was no longer accepted as fact, and make additions to the accumulation of medical knowledge up to that late 6th century moment in time in China. And the book was called the Zhu Bing Yuan Hou Lun. Among its various English names is the General Treatise on the Causes and Manifestations of All Diseases. In honor of Chao Yuanfang and the brute force research he did to compile and write the text, it's also referred to as the Chao Shi Bing Yuan, Chao's Treatise on the Causes and Symptoms of Diseases. Contained in the 50 volumes of this encyclopedia were 1,739 diseases and symptoms that were sorted by 67 categories of diseases. It was submitted to the Sui Emperor Yang in the year 610 and counts as the first ever medical encyclopedia in China, and I believe in the world as well. There may have been others that came before, but they haven't made it to our day yet. But you never know what might come out of the next archaeological discovery in China. The book is mainly concerned with the origins and symptoms of diseases. It drew on all the proven knowledge from the great texts of the past 600 years, the Huangdi Neijing and the Shannong Bansao Jing included. Just about everything was covered in this book, and... It proved that even though these figures from Chinese history lived more than 1,400 years ago, they knew quite a bit. Allergies, parasitic diseases, skin diseases of every imaginable kind, infections, and dental care, too. As a one-stop shop for all aspiring med students and practicing physicians, it was a heck of a resource And at least for many generations to follow, this was an indispensable desk reference for everyone in the trade. Many of the suggested remedies to certain afflictions involved Dao Yin, a kind of breathing and meditation exercise that's sometimes described as an early form of Qi Gong. The purpose of engaging in specific Dao Yin exercises is to put your Qi back in balance. That's a very rich part of Taoist Nei Gong tradition and practiced widely. I mentioned the Ma Wangdui excavation in Changsha, Hunan, and all the amazing discoveries made there, particularly with the Yellow Emperor's inner canon. Well, they also recovered a painted scroll, and it's called the Dao Yin Tu, and depicts 44 figures posing in various sitting and standing Dao Yin positions. So these exercises mentioned in the Zhu Bing Yuan Hou Lun went back to the 2nd century BC at least. So we can see from this Zhu Bing Yuan Hou Lun, or general treatise on the causes and manifestations of all diseases, Chao Yuanfang didn't prescribe some drug for everything. For some diseases, the book called for this Nei Gong therapeutic form of exercise to restore internal harmony and to cure the patient. So Chao Yuanfang did all his great things in the late 500s, early 600s, and on the heels of his great achievement, bringing Chinese medicine up to date, came two more noteworthy figures from the history of Chinese medicine. These were Sun Si Miao and Su Jing. And when we talk about those two, we're really in the early years of the Tang Dynasty, Taizong, Gaozong, and the Empress Wu years. And one thing you could say about these most golden of years of this dynasty, thanks to the development of the Silk Roads between the time of Emperor Wu of Han and Tang Gaozong, people from all over the known world had been coming to the great trading centers of China. 
And ground zero, of course, was the Tang capital in Chang'an, the modern-day capital of Shanxi province, the city of Xi'an. So many people mixing and mingling during those centuries between 200 B.C. and 600 A.D. A lot of information could be exchanged. Not only new foods and food additives were passed back and forth, and new ideas, new science and innovations. China wasn't the only place on earth making all these great discoveries in all the great civilizations amongst the Persians, Arabs, across the Turkic lands, and into India. They, too, spent centuries experimenting, observing, writing about, and studying medicine and herbal concoctions. The Princess Wencheng story also comes from this time. Tang Taizong married her off to the Tibetan king, and as the story goes, she brought with her all these great treasures of Chinese culture, including tea. So one of the key points to remember during this period where the free flow of information was being exchanged in so many directions, it supercharged all the states and kingdoms who took this acquired knowledge and bettered their respective societies with the benefits. And a lot of new remedies and medical knowledge seeped into China as well and brought new discoveries and fine-tuned others. In the Tang Dynasty... One man's star shines brighter than anyone else's. And this was Sun Si Miao, the Yao Wang, the king of medicines. His story is one of a saintly man in the mold of many other role models in ancient and modern Chinese history. He was a sickly child born to a poor Shanxi family. He suffered from certain childhood infirmities that caused a degree of financial strain for his family. And as the historians wrote it, in order to ameliorate the costs to his parents, the young Sun Si Miao read everything he possibly could that was available in his early years in order to treat himself. He lived 581 to 682, a good 101 years by my reckoning. That's the whole Sui dynasty and the Tang up to Gaozong. He also immersed himself in Confucian, Taoist, and Buddhist scholarship and philosophy and incorporated aspects of all of these ideas into his own life. All of the most widely read and respected medical texts, the Shanghan Lun most of all, Sun Si Miao acquainted himself with all of these books. So he became a self-taught physician of great skill and renown. And three emperors all tried like crazy to recruit Sun Si Miao to some appropriate position in the imperial court. But no matter how enticing the offer, Sun Si Miao remained committed to his one true ideal. And that was to serve the people. Really serve the people. To use his skill set to cure anyone suffering and in need of medical care. He was never swayed by the size of a patient's wallet, nor their station in life. Sun Si Miao was painted as a man who aspired to nothing more than to serve humanity by treating his patients and continuing his research into the causes of diseases and how to prevent them and treat them. Although most of his time and research was spent in his native Shanxi province, he also traveled throughout the land, enhancing his understanding of medicine and treating patients. And from 605 to 618, he was said to have lived and practiced in Sichuan. There were two medical texts that we remember Sun Si Miao for, the Qianjing Yao Fang and the Qianjing Yi Fang. These were the prescriptions of the thousand ounces of gold and the supplement to the prescriptions of the thousand ounces of gold. The Qianjing Yaofang, or Beiji Qianjing Yaofang, as it's also called, came out in 652, the early years of Tang Gaozong. The information contained in the 30 volumes of this work covers first aid, febrile diseases, diabetes, gynecological and pediatric diseases, common internal and external disorders, ophthalmology, acupuncture, moxibustion, and like a lot of these milestone texts, it gave a summation of all known medical knowledge. It wrote of the past greats going back to Zhang Zhongjing and Hua Tuo in the Eastern Han. 
just like it often was in most advanced civilizations, as they got wiser, China's doctors had to keep going back and revising or deleting all these previous diagnoses and treatments to continually update the old learning with the new. This work by Sun Si Miao also contains thousands of prescriptions for a wide range of medicines used to treat all the known maladies of the 7th century. In its day, it was a monumental work. And this text by Sun Si Miao was revised not long after with the Tianjin Yi Fang, and this supplement to the prescriptions of the thousand ounces of gold listed an additional couple thousand drugs derived from plants, minerals, animals, and other edibles, including many effective folk remedies. Artists have often drawn and illustrated Sun Si Miao together with a dragon and a tiger that represented yang and yin, respectively. He's a popular theme in Chinese art, where TCM was concerned. Not only was this work filled with so much information and learning, it was written in a clear and easy-to-understand writing style that made the books more accessible to those who used it as a reference. He emphasized nutrition and healthy living. Many medicines and tonics were also listed that claimed to preserve longevity. In these books, Sun Si Miao called for conditions such as goiters and other enlargements of the thyroid gland to be treated with iodine derived from the thyroid gland of sheep and pigs. This was 1,200 years before the French chemist Bernard Courtois first isolated iodine in 1811. He also learned that nyctalopia, or night blindness, should be treated with vitamin A and beriberi, caused by a thiamine deficiency, with vitamin B1. Maybe Sun Si Miao, this Yao Wang, the king of medicines or prescriptions, maybe he didn't understand the reasons behind some of these discoveries, but the prescriptions worked. Sun Si Miao emphasized avoiding disease and all manners of 7th century afflictions of the day by living a healthy lifestyle. He strongly advocated for purposely living a lifestyle without excess, where your essence wasn't wasted and your chi always in balance throughout your organs. It was better to point to this line of thinking than to resort to treating the disease after it had manifested itself. So these two works by Sun Si Miao brought everything once again to not only the state of the art in his time in the early years of the Tang, but also served as a handy reference book for almost everything a physician or healer might want to know from first aid to surgery. And like Sima Qian did in his records of the Grand Historian with regard to China's historiography, Sun Si Miao, too, reviewed the important advances in medical knowledge going back to the Han, and this included his comments on the Yellow Emperor's inner canon. Besides this encyclopedic work on all known information regarding the practice of clinical medicine in China, Sun Si Miao's knowledge of herbal medicines was what made him the legend that he became. He explained how to mix them and prepare them, as well as what time of the year and the time of day to gather them. The Tang histories say he wrote about 519 new medicinal herbs and roots that he had found in the 133 counties in China that he passed through during his travels. And among these remedies, as I mentioned, were many folk remedies from the countryside that the people in those parts figured out by themselves. And much of the information on gynecology and treatments for women and children in this Tianjin Yao Fang book were still in use well into the Song Dynasty. The supplement to the Tianjin Yao Fang was what Sun Si Miao worked on during the last years of his life. It was a work that brought his prescriptions of the thousand ounces of gold up to date. And in the 30 volumes of this supplement... It listed 800 medicinal herbs, roots, plants, animals, minerals, and how to prepare many of them. It also contained a lot of commentary to previous works, Zhang Zhongjing's Shang Han Lun, I think I mentioned, being one of them. He was definitely a major guy in Chinese alchemy. I believe I mentioned him in that two-part series. He's credited with 
one of the more important alchemical texts in the history of Chinese alchemy. This was the Essentials of the Elixir Manuals for Oral Transmission, the Tai Qing Dan Qing Yao Jue. His own longevity was hinted to be attributed to his intake of these alchemical elixirs. And just as we have our Hippocratic Oath that all doctors swear to, the Chinese version came from Sun Tzu Miao, and part of it went, quote, A great physician should not pay attention to status, wealth, or age. Neither should he question whether the particular person is attractive or unattractive, whether he is an enemy or a friend, whether he is a Chinese or a foreigner, or finally, whether he is uneducated or educated. He should meet everyone on equal grounds. He should always act as if he were thinking of his own close relatives. End quote. I'm not sure if today's TCM grads have to say it, but you can see the ideal that Sun Tzu Miao held up. And the Tang histories? They say this guy didn't just talk the talk. He exemplified the compassionate and caring physician, working tirelessly in his research to find new medicines that either proactively supported a person's well-being or relieved symptoms of all manners of illnesses. So, like the mythical Bian Chue, Hua Tuo, Huang Fu Mi, Zhang Zhong Jing, and others, to be sure, we remember Sun Si Miao for taking the understanding of medicine in China to a new level. And we also remember him for his ethics and for representing, in the official histories at least, what the ideal once was for how physicians should carry out their work. And this is a theme in popular culture that never goes out of style. The selfless physician. American TV was filled with shows like House MD, The Good Doctor, Chicago Hope, Private Practice, Dr. Kildare, and Marcus Welby MD, to name a few. And that was just in the U.S. Let me introduce one more important landmark medical text from this time in the Tang Dynasty. This was the publication of the Xinxiu Ben Cao the newly revised Materia Medica. Sun Si Miao contributed to this updated version of Tao Hong Jing's Ben Cao Jing Ji Ju mentioned earlier, the collected annotations of Shen Nong's Materia Medica. Tao Hong Jing had brought this ancient classic up to the level of sophistication and understanding during his time in the late 400s, early 500s. And now... With all the new discoveries made since Tao Hong Jing's passing at the start of the Sui, up to the year 659, during the years of the Tang Emperor Gaozong, it was time for another freshening up. That's how fast things were changing by this time. And the one who was most associated with this newly revised Materia Medica, the Xinxiu Ben Cao, was Su Jing. Because it came out during the Tang, it's also referred to as the Tang Ben Cao, or Materia Medica of the Tang. The main punchline with respect to this newly revised Materia Medica is that it's what we call a pharmacopoeia. Pharmacopoeias are these compilations that were sponsored or sanctioned by a government. It was a national, or in this case, an imperial effort to update the combined accumulated knowledge about everything concerning Drugs, formulas, methods of mixing these formulas, requirements, and tests to carry out to measure the strength and purity of these drugs, and a horn of plenty of other kinds of related information. Not even Shen Nong himself could have ever imagined this science of pharmacology that ancient tradition says he started, that it could have come this far. And with the publication of this pharmacopoeia, it was, it's believed, the first time anywhere in the world that a government got behind such an effort as this one to produce this Xinxiu Ben Cao. No cost was spared. Some two dozen of surely the most capable pharmacologists in the land worked on the compilation and writing of this massive medical work. It contained text illustrations, and pictorial descriptions of procedures. It contains something like 850 medicines, about 15% of which were new. And it stayed pretty current all the way into the Song Dynasty, where it was given yet another makeover. A copy of the 
newly revised Materia Medica was shipped to Japan in 721. And good thing, too. I know you're getting tired of hearing this, but the originals of this Shinsho Bunshal were lost to whatever violence or natural disasters caused their disappearance. So in this case, there was a backup that could be studied by scholars. And this great pharmacopoeia was an essential source at any TCM dispensary, at least until its inevitable update during the Northern Song. In the half century between the fall of the Tang and the founding of the Song, these bunzhals, or materia medicas, kept getting tightened up, and the inaccuracies were corrected or deleted, and new discoveries were added. Let's just finish off with one more Tang Dynasty great from the field of medicine, and this was Wang Tao. He's remembered for a work called the Wai Tai Mi Yao. This was completed in 752, the last years of Xuanzong, which go hand in hand with the setup for the Anlushan Rebellion. This work, the Wai Tai Mi Yao, known in English as the Essential Secrets from the Palace Library, is another work of immense historical value as well as for its importance to TCM. This comprehensive medical text and Sun Si Miao's Qian Jin Yao Fang became the most widely used and collectively served as another periodic revised benchmark in the advancement of Chinese medicine. This was especially with regard to their combined efforts in gynecology and obstetrics. In fact, Sun Si Miao is, among other accolades, also called the father of Chinese gynecology. He was said to have written that a woman's body is ten times more difficult to treat than a man's. In his Qian Jin Yao Fang, Sun Si Miao included a section called Recipes for Women. And what Wang Tao did with his work was to go back through the mists of time, back to the Han Dynasty when the earliest and most important works were being written for the first time. And he meticulously went through everything of value, researching centuries worth of knowledge and reorganized it into this 40-volume work containing almost 7,000 prescription recipes organized in useful and practical categories such as most often used. There's also a whole section devoted to acupuncture that presented everything learned from the time of Bian Chue that had been perfected in the Han, the Jin, and to that point in the Tang when Wang Tao wrote the text. Some of these many medical treatises were discovered in the caves of Dunhuang, all of it from the Sui and Tang period. So this period of the Tang dynasty, for Chinese medicine at least, was one of the great advances where a lot of the old medical classics were freshened up and scholars came forward to review all the accumulated knowledge up to this period from the 7th to 10th centuries and brought it up to date. And we'll see more of this next time in part four when we look at the history of Chinese medicine in the Song Dynasty. February 1st, 2024, barring any unforeseen circumstances, I'll be in London as part of the festivities and special events to mark the opening of an exhibition at the London Science Museum. Come see Ziming Chong, Ning Shi Ju Jun, Clockwork Treasures from China's Forbidden City. There will be an exquisitely curated collection of 23 stunning Ziming Zhong mechanical chime clocks, direct from the Hall of Clocks at the world-famous Palace Museum in Beijing, on display at the London Science Museum. I'll see you in London at the opening. Okay, I thank you all for listening. I really appreciate that uh, you keep me in your podcast listening queue. There's so much great stuff out there. More history of Chinese medicine coming next time. Until then, this is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from West L.A., inviting you to come back next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.